So we've looked at thesauri, also known as controlled vocabularies. And what makes a controlled vocabulary controlled is that it's a predefined set of terms. A predefined set of terms that are allowable to describe a thing. Some organization out there has exerted control over the set of terms that can be used as descriptive metadata. On the flip side, we have what's called in information science jargon, an uncontrolled vocabulary, which means, I think pretty obviously, that there is no control over the vocabulary that you can use as descriptive metadata. You can use any word or any phrase that you want. So let's look at some uncontrolled vocabularies. Uh, now, a type of uncontrolled vocabulary that's probably already familiar to you is tags. Now, tags are very common on the web. They are nothing new. Uh, most sites that have any kind of social functionality at all use tags. And one tag system that you're probably familiar with is tagging videos that you upload to YouTube. And what we're looking at here is a video that I created for a different course that I uploaded to YouTube. So let me scroll down a little bit to where it says tags. And note that I've created uh, several different tags, digital library, NSF, etc. And I've used the term NSF, and you can't see the whole tag here, but this says National Science Foundation, which are two versions of the same name. NSF is short for National Science Foundation. YouTube does not exert any kind of control over the tags that I am allowed to use when I upload videos to YouTube, which is why I used both NSF and National Science Foundation. If I were using, say, the Library of Congress subject headings, there would probably be a use for relation there, and it would probably say NSF use National Science Foundation. Right? So there would only be a need for one term, but this is an uncontrolled system, so I thought in the, for the sake of findability, so anyone searching would find this particular video, no matter what term they used. Now, let's look at what YouTube says tags are. If I click on this little help icon, YouTube says keywords to help people discover your video, right? So YouTube says a tag equals a keyword, right? A tag is a term, a word. And equally importantly, it's for discovery, right? To help people discover your video. Now, if somebody were to search for the term NSF, they would retrieve among, you know, a bazillion other videos, this video in the list of what they've retrieved. The point is, I can use any term that I want here. YouTube does not exert any kind of control over the terms that I'm allowed to use. Now, another tagging system that you're probably familiar with is tagging photos on Facebook, and this is an embarrassingly old photograph of me at Halloween. So if I wanted to tag this photo, I could tag photo and, you know, click on my hat. And if I wanted to say that this hat was the Washington Monument, I could do that. Again, there is no control over what I can tag something as. If I want to say my hat is the Washington Monument, I can do that. Uh, excuse me, not YouTube. Facebook does, however, 
exert some control. You can only tag something with the name of something that already exists in Facebook, right? Something must have a Facebook page in order for you to use that name as a tag, right? The Washington Monument has a Facebook presence, and so I can use that as a tag for my hat if I want to. So this is not exactly an uncontrolled vocabulary because there is a finite set of terms that you can use, that is things with a Facebook presence. Now that's a very large set of things, but it is finite, right? So tagging photos in Facebook is sort of uncontrolled, but not completely uncontrolled. Now, another tag system that you're probably familiar with is Twitter, is the Twitter hashtag. Now, the idea of the hashtag is that you can use any term at all as a hashtag. And in this case, I've done a search for the hashtag Coursera, Right? And all of the tweets in this list here use the hashtag Coursera. Now, not all hashtags are descriptive. Most may not be. It's hard to say. I've not seen any kind of data on the use of hashtags in this way. Uh, one of the most common hashtags, of course, is the hashtag fail, which is not a descriptive term for the tweet necessarily. It's sort of a meta statement about what, the motivation behind the tweet, perhaps. Um, and hashtags are kind of an interesting halfway point between the content, the text of the tweet, and metadata about the tweet. Um, a hashtag can be uh, part of the text of the tweet, this is the Museum of Life and Science, which is a museum uh, near me in Durham, North Carolina. And this reads, Ranger Greg spotted what looks like tiny teeth marks, right? That hashtag is actually reads as part of the text of the tweet. But it also indicates authorship. I happen to know, because I go to the Museum of Life and Science, um, that the Hashtag Ranger Greg indicates that Ranger Greg is the author of this particular tweet. He probably took this photo and he wrote the tweet, right? So this hashtag is being used in two ways, as part of the text of the tweet and as an indication of authorship. Right? So hashtags are actually really interesting from an information science perspective because they kind of ride the line between metadata and the thing that the metadata is about and kind of blur that line. Um, and then it gets even more interesting because there's at least one project out there um, that I know of anyway, TagDef, that allows people to define the meaning of hashtags, right? So what you've got here is, for example, the hashtag throwback Thursday and the definition is an old picture of you that you post on Thursdays, right? That this project tag def does not turn hashtags into a controlled vocabulary, but it does allow you to create a scope note for a tag. And a scope note is part of a controlled vocabulary. So it does allow one feature of a controlled vocabulary to exist for hashtags. Now, a system that implements a truer form of uncontrolled vocabularies, of a uncontrolled vocabulary, is uh, Flickr. And this is a photo of mine. Don't even ask why I have a photo of a goat in my Flickr account. Um, I'm a bad Flickr user because I haven't actually assigned any tags to this photo. Uh, so if I wanted to, I could assign the tag goat and eventually it would add that as a tag to this particular photo. Now, people use all kinds of tags on their photos in Flickr, and uh, this rather nice photo of the Space Needle. Um, this user 
use the tags Seattle, Seattle Center, and Photo Friday. I have no idea what that means, right? YouTube, I'm sorry, excuse me, Flickr allows you to use any tag you want, uncontrolled system, and this user used a term, Photo Friday, that I'm not even familiar with, and that's fine, right? Someone out there is familiar with the term Photo Friday and perhaps is searching for photos taken on Photo Friday, I don't know, right? Sometimes what you get is um, tags that give you geographic information. Sometimes you get photo, uh, get tags on photos that give you information about the camera. Um, this photo, for example, has the tag I. O-H-O-N-E. That user misspelled iPhone. And misspellings happen all the time in uncontrolled vocabulary schemes because there is no control over the term, terms that you can use, right? If there were a controlled vocabulary here, Flickr might have caught that there was a typo and corrected it, but Flickr does not exert any control over the tags that you choose. Now, what we have here is what's called a tag cloud. And I'm sure you've seen these before as well. Over time, if you get enough tags being entered into a system like Flickr, like YouTube, etc., you can generate a tag cloud, which allows you to surface trends, right? The way this kind of tag cloud works is the size of the tag, the font, the larger the font, the more tags exist in the system. So Instagram app, and iPhoneography are very popular tags on Flickr where, you know, animals and Asia are considerably less popular, right? And these are the all-time most popular tags on Flickr. And if Flickr tracked it, and maybe they do track it, but they don't make it visible on this page, you could even see that the popularity of tags changes over time, right? Instagram presumably has increased in popularity with the increase in popularity of Instagram. Maybe during Mardi Gras, for example, you would see a spike in the tag festival or the tag Mardi Gras, whatever, right? And this is an advantage to uncontrolled vocabularies in live dynamic systems like Flickr and Twitter and YouTube and whatnot. If you collect the data, you can track changes over time, but that's a separate issue. So another system that uses tags is a, um, is a system called Library Thing, which if you're not familiar with it, is a service to help people catalog their own books. So if we scroll down a little bit, we can see the top 75 tags in a tag cloud, which is different than the Flickr tag cloud because the font does not indicate the popularity of the tag. Instead, you get a number next to the tag that indicates the number of times that that tag has been used. Right? Users can tag their books on library thing users can tag their books with any tag they want. Again, it's an uncontrolled system. But often those tags end up being descriptive, right? You look at the top few tags here and what are they? Fiction, nonfiction, fantasy, history, science fiction, mystery, biography, etc. Those are what you might think of as genres, right? 
And if we were to drill down into, let's say, science fiction, you get related tags. You get cyberpunk, dystopia, fantasy, humor, Star Wars, etc. Right? You get sub-genres under the larger umbrella genre of science fiction. Right? So uncontrolled vocabularies aren't always as chaotic as you might think. What you see in library thing is that structure emerges, a hierarchy emerges kind of organically out of the terms that the thousands or millions or however many users um, are using. You do, however, get some fairly idiosyncratic tags like read and to read and own, which is in here somewhere, if I can only find it, own right there. Right? What does that mean? Does that mean that the user of library thing owns that particular book? Maybe. I don't know. Right? Maybe it's somebody's initials. Who knows? But the important point is that structure does start to emerge. And what you're likely to find is that, say, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is going to be tagged more often with tags like science fiction and humor than it is with tags like mystery. Right? So uncontrolled vocabularies do allow a certain amount of structure and description that can be agreed upon collectively to emerge. Now, there's some interesting work that's been going on in information science about how metadata from uncontrolled vocabularies, like tags, can be used to update controlled vocabularies like the Library of Congress subject headings. But again, that's a discussion for another course, frankly. So in conclusion, the difference between controlled vocabularies and uncontrolled vocabularies is the existence, or not, of a thesaurus. Has some organization created a predefined set of terms that are allowable to describe a thing? Right? Has some organization made an attempt to exert control over the vocabulary that is permissible to use as descriptive metadata? Or are the doors thrown wide open and anyone can use any descriptive term they want?